All right, welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast. Today, we have Scott from Primal MKE, MMA and Fitness. Welcome, Scott. Well, thank you. I lost the connection there a little bit. Everything okay? Yeah, everything's all good. It'll record in the Okay, yeah. Well, hello there. Uh, th thanks for coming on. You, you reached out after our John Mackey episode, and it looks like you have a lot of the same training philosophy as John Mackey does around, uh, I guess, a constraints-based approach and a ecological practice design. So we'll dive into that. But first, you want to maybe provide a, a background about yourself and, and what you're doing. Oh, okay. Yeah, very briefly. I'm from Scotland originally. I took up the sport a little late. Um, short amateur career. A little bit of schooling, trying to find out how it all works, makes sense of training and coaching and whatnot, and uh, brings me all the way fast forward to where I'm here, about 16, 17 years in the sport. have my own gym now, for better or worse, just trying to uh, adhere to the principles of uh, ecological uh, dynamics. Yeah. And to, to uh, th that's the approach that we're taking for MMA, kickboxing, and jiu-jitsu. Awesome. Do you want to just maybe move a little closer to your mic there, Scott, just to... to... Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're good, yep. you're good. All right. So let's dive, let's dive into this. I think it's a, it's a cool topic in combat sports because combat sports is generally rooted in tradition, the way it's trained. And this is kind of breaking that mold. And on your Instagram, if anyone wants to follow Scott, primal underscore MKE, you've got an ecologically driven practice environment for mixed martial arts. So let's start. What, what does that mean? What is an ecologically driven practice environment? Okay, well, I've started to change the way I talk about this kind of stuff because it can be kind of unnecessarily kind of wordy mm. and with a jargon and stuff. Yeah. And I just feel I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm not able to get my message over very well or people kind of zone out or just think I'm being un, unnecessarily mm -hmm. pretentious and I can still do a little bit of that, but, um, so, uh, ecological, um, so, so, so in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is keep the environment and the learners, uh, together and coupled together. So we see through um, ecological dynamics is a kind of marriage of ecological psychology and dynamic systems, which complex dynamic systems approach. Here's me saying I'm not using the buzzword, <laughs> right? Um, but in, in its essence, um, if to, to strip it down, it's that we interact with the world as we perceive it directly. So you think of any task in your life, we move around the world and we act within the world directly, but we're never really removed from our context or environment. So really what ecological dynamics is saying, uh, if I have to really boil it down, is that humans are very complex systems. Put two together in a fight, it's even more complex. And what we're really trying to do is just keep the training as much as possible within that kind of authentic, coupled, chaotic s sphere, that space. So what ecological advocates all uh, advocate for is not splitting it apart and kind of getting rid of the old ways of traditional uh, isolated training and making it more holistic. Yeah, it sounds like from what you said there, it's almost like everything needs to be in context when you're training. In context and extent, right? It's, it's, it's combat sports. So, I mean, we can't recreate fights every day, yeah. although that might be effective. It's it's not, not, <laughs> not very good for longevity. It's not very sustainable. So, but, but that's in, se in essence, right? You know, and a lot of people say, well, you're just doing situational drilling. And while it's not just situational drilling, it's, it's pretty close, you know, we, we cut the game into slices and we just explore there and we play a lot from these same areas. So uh, that would be doing it somewhat of a disservice to say it's just situational sparring. But it's, it's if, if you want to say that, that's getting us all, a lot of the way there. Nice. So I guess the question from that becomes, so there's, there's one, I guess, prominent jujitsu player. He doesn't, I don't think he competes anymore, Kit Dale. And he was 100% against drilling. He was like, yes. never drills, nothing, only, I guess, roll situational sparring and things like that. Obviously, that's taking one end of the spectrum, one to the extreme. And then there's obviously other people on the other end that are just drilling all the time and then maybe just fighting. So within that, do drills, I guess, closed, non-contextual drills, some pad work or whatever, that, does that fit into your methodology of coaching and training and learning? And if so, or if not, where does it? So it, it doesn't really fit into what I'm doing. It's somewhat contradictory because, um, again, that, that's that's breaking down the sport and, and you're, you're not keeping the, um, you know, the learner embedded and embodied mm. in the environment. So I don't see a lot of value in it. However, I'm not 
so zealous that I'll say that there, there isn't some value in it. I, I do think there's like motivational, psychological, physiological benefits of like pad work and maybe drilling, especially from motivational side for people to feel like they're achieving something. But but for the most part, uh, when I have a group together, we, we don't put a great deal of value in all that stuff. Interesting. Okay. So if someone's a rank beginner coming in for the first time, do they also jump straight into these, I guess, situational style drills? Yeah, right away. So um, again, this is often a common pushback, but you can't just let beginners go at it. And, and, and yeah, I agree with that. You, you can't just let them go at it. But you can go, you can let them go at it at a, a, a certain, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse alert. me. <laughs> yeah, I got the amber alert. Yeah. Um, you can let them go at it to a certain extent with a small sliver of the game. And that's essentially where I think the craft in uh, delivering this approach from is just finding the right kind of challenge point, mm. finding the right uh, appropriate level of the game for the learner, and then we just build on top of that. So we're, as, as, as a coach myself, we're just kind of designing the game, designing the environment. So it's very, very gamified. There's always a very a clear task or objective for both sides, and we play in that space. And as they progress, we, we make it a bit more complex, and, and, and then for newer people, we just bring it down a bit. I love that. I, I'm trying to speak, speak about, again, rather than get lost in other words and the, the, the highfalutin esoteric stuff, just, you know, really just talk about it on the, 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 the brass bolts that coaches will understand right away. Yeah, no, I, I really, really like that. So do you want to maybe provide maybe a, some, an example, maybe from kickboxing, MMA, jiu-jitsu of how, how you would regress that right down, maybe just some, some basic... Uh, situational or gamification that you would use with someone that came in? I mean, it's my, might be specific to the situation or the level of the person, but just a general example. Okay, so it, let's say, uh, first of all, what are we trying to achieve for, for striking here? Let's take a striking example. So uh, what am I trying to achieve for striking, uh, for striking is to have my learners or my students or my teammate, whatever, um, in a position where they can receive and produce force effectively so it'd be a good base and learn to uh, i'm going to use the word read mm -hmm. learn to pick up on the information that their partner opponent's given them mm -hmm. and start building relationships with that whether it be range whether it be uh, defensive um, measures whether it be attacking measures uh, we speak a lot you know i have to use some of the words here but they talk a lot in ecological psychology is that, that we're surrounded by affordances right and affordances are just opportunities to act uh, so looking and striking perspective when is your opponent uh, reachable when are they punchable when are they kickable this kind of stuff and that's not immediately apparent for someone who's yeah. who's a novice they don't pick up on that they're not sensitive to that information yet and i believe that's really what expertise is over time we're getting more and more sensitive to to these affordances and building relationships with them so we're able to exploit them so that brings us all the way back. Does it, does it make sense to me to show someone how to move out of context? Does it make sense to me to really even show them how to kick or punch out of context? Not really. Not really from the way I'm coming at it. Uh, there's a whole other discussion whether that can be used as a supplement off, offline, but if that answers your question a little bit, mm -hmm. I, I ask myself two things. What, what, we're trying to, what are we actually trying to achieve by learning the sport? And then how can we make that, you know, a, a, a challenging little game for the learners to come in and start picking up that implicitly. Gotcha. And how, how would you apply that within a grappling context? Uh, with grappling, the same. So um, here's one thing. I, I think striking might be harder and more nuanced, but I think it's m more simple to an, to an extent, right? Mm -hmm. You can punch and you can yep. kick. You can evade, you can intercept, you can, you can, you can land, right? Um, grappling so much more you know we're, we're upside down we're side to side whatever there's there's a there's a lot to develop and and from, from that space so again going back to what we said like situational stuff we'll just start off and we'll, we'll pick the most common areas of the game and we'll start building and designing little games off off there um a lot of the actual goal of what you're trying to do are already kind of it's inherent in the game you know you tell someone to stay on top or you you, you tell someone to hold the back and 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 we, we just, we, we, we layer games onto this. Uh, so we don't see jujitsu as a collection of techniques. We see it more perhaps as a, a series of strategies and tactics. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the space, that's the space that we'll kind of put our, our students in. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. Because a lot of the times, from day one. a lot of times you're taught maybe a technique or a chain of techniques, but then you go to apply them and then something else, the, the opponent does something different than when you were drilling it. And then suddenly your technique doesn't work anymore and you have no idea of, 
you know, where you're going to move next, because all you did was drill that technique and then maybe the next progression after you got through a certain phase, but you never got through that phase in the first place. I well, that's a, and that's an important thing about uh, gaining expertise or becoming uh, developing expertise is that you need that valid feedback, right? Okay, so you need that feedback in the moment. What I mean by valid feedback, f feedback for me just means you know you're you're getting some kind of you're getting some kind of feedback on whether something worked or not. You know, did you succeed? Did you fail? Did yeah. you almost succeed? Did you did you only just fail and whatnot? But I think that has to be uh, real and authentic, for the most part. Yeah. I don't think we get that from drilling. I don't think we get it from a coach barking where your elbow should have been or where your foot should be. I think that happens over time and time. And what happens uh, when we're going live and there is a bit of resistance, there's a much higher, um, there, of course, there's a much higher prevalence of failure, yeah. which we manage through how we design the games. But the, the feedback's always s somewhat highly valid. And that's where I think the learning really occurs. How much, I guess, verbal or even just like actual coaching do you put into say some of these games for a beginner? Are you say, as, as an example, you mentioned, maybe a novice comes in, they don't know, uh, I guess, range. They don't know when there's an opening to be able to throw a punch and land. Are you able, are, are you still giving them, Hey, you know, giving them feedback maybe afterwards or during like, these are the things to, to kind of look for, or are you just letting them figure it out themselves over the weeks? Uh, so again, a couple of ways to answer that question. First of all, what do I expect to see in a session? You know, I don't, I can't really measure whether anyone's learned anything in a session. Mm -hmm. It's whether they start over when I'm watching them over time and they, they starting to be in the right place a bit more often than not. Mm -hmm. I don't always think that needs to be conscious, um, or ex explicitly understood. Um, but for the sake of striking, you know, they, they don't want to fall on their ass. So they're, or they're, you know, authentically and organically getting into these these bladed you know strong based positions and they're starting to pick up on their partner's movement so the in and out and it looks clum it looks fucking clumsy and, and and chaotic at the start and it looks awful right so but fighting isn't scored on aesthetics and we don't what, what do we expect from newer newer players newer beginners you know that's mm -hmm. actually a feature it's not a bug that the body seizes up the body's trying to figure out so it's trying to use every single you know it's locking all these muscles and joints and, and this is where we get this kind of clumsiness this clunkiness they call it like the, the de degrees of freedom problem mm -hmm. and over time as they get more fluid and you'll see this come from almost any skill or movement it starts to become more fluent and fluid and look more as i say aesthetically pleasing so i, I don't worry about that early on if, how they look or how they're managing it. I just, if the, if the, if the task or the goal, whether it be in a striking would be to, to tag them with a, a punch or a, or a, a kick in the belly button or in the front leg, the stuff kind of unfolds and takes care of itself. Mm, okay. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to take maybe some of the questions that people listening to this might have, and that might be, sure. okay, they go into this, they run this approach, but the, they're not punching properly, striking properly, maybe they're not doing whatever the technique is in the grappling properly, and therefore they're picking up bad habits going into as okay. they progress down. Is that something that you see happen at all? Is that something that you're worried about at all? Or does that iron itself out over time? Yes, I think it irons itself out over time, but I would throw the question, and I'm not trying to be evasive, yeah. but first of all, what, what, what does that mean, that the correct technique? Yeah. And... Lastly, no, what is it? What is a bad habit? Okay, I, I know what bad habits are, but we go back again to the validity of feedback. I don't worry about bad habits because they'll kind of get ironed out in the wash. As long as we're doing enough sparring, as long as we're doing a lot of live um, interaction where you're constantly testing things, these bad habits likely, if they do appear, they're going to get identified a little quicker through the live play and exchanges. Now, if you're, this is interesting, right? Because when we're doing MMA, if, if we maybe perhaps just stick to just a, just striking for that session and there's no threat of takedown, well, not necessarily a bad habit, but you're going to find a strategy and a solution that works for striking that, that, that might not be optimal when mm. you add takedowns. Mm -hmm. So these are the way we have to identify where we're guiding the learners and the, the what ifs, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to make it as holistic as possible. I think we still, we, I still do that in my gym. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll separate the grappling because some people just want to grapple, some people just want to strike. And we still kind of break it apart a bit more than I'd like. But I think you should try and take the whole game in context. Now, what we'll say about the striking 
um, and, and doing it this way because we don't encourage hard sparring and we don't encourage head contact when novices are just learning. The, the, the punches, the, the so-called correct techniques, they do take time because they're not the focus of the, the activities. The focus of the activities is, is distance management and picking up on affordances. So the, 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 the technical strikes or the technical movements, I think are probably, there's a good, good argument to be made that they, they take longer to come. Mm-hmm. But again, what is, what is an ideal punch? For me, the ideal punch is the one that lands <laughs> yeah. in the moment for that very, very specific and unique uh, instance. Yeah, that's what I really, really. Some things will work better than others. Yeah, yeah. that's why I really like the, like this approach. And I think people they tend to only get the stimulus from when they're doing hard sparring, hard rolling, and that's the only time they really have it. The rest of the time is spent. People only get the stimulus. Uh, people only, you know, pad work, heavy bag, just drilling combinations, and the only real feedback, live feedback they get is when they go into hard sparring, maybe once a week, to really put it into context. And that's why I, I really like this. Because you can do your technical sparring and technical drills and have that feedback and be able to always react to the, the whole idea of, of agility, right? Where people will run through ladders and do all sorts of weird shit, but they won't actually stand in front of someone and react to whatever's happening in front of them. They will actually transfer to their game versus some flashing lights. And then, oh, I improved my reaction time on the flashing lights, but you know, what's that going to do? Well, and there's so much of that, right? The flashing oh, lights dude. and, and the, the floor <laughs> markers and stuff. And, and again, it doesn't take, it, it's a little bit of laziness. I, I get it. This is what we're seeing. You know, I was a copy and paste coach for years, so I, I get it. But, you know, when we understand that agility is very much information driven mm-hmm. and specific to the actual very, very context, and it doesn't, it's, that stuff doesn't, it starts to make less and less sense. So footwork and agility, again, will, will, will take care of itself over time if you design the practice appropriately and, and push people into different spaces. It's, it's interesting as well. Like a lot of people will say they don't want to start maybe at home. Say, say they're looking to get into a martial art. They're not going to start at home by themselves for what I mentioned around, say, for example, bad habits and things. But it seems like a lot of these games someone could do with a partner and start themselves and not have to worry so much about that. Even say without a coach, if they have the right design, I guess, situational drills, they could start themselves at home? Oh, I absolutely think they can start themselves at home. If they get, you know, I mean, um, mm-hmm. is, a, is a coach helpful as a guide into, you know, um, design practice and find the appropriate level of, of, of challenge? I, I think that's where, for me, that's where this, the, the skill and, and what I'm trying to do as a coach comes in. It's not from micromanaging people's... We we're speaking about, um, it could, could a couple of guys get a... Yeah, get some mats in the garage mm-hmm. and open YouTube and go for it. I think absolutely they can. In fact, I'm, 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 I think coaches can be more of a rate limiter mm. as anything when they're constantly interfering and getting in the way and, and as I say, micromanaging their, their their students' movements and what they expect from the students. My expectations for beginners are extremely low, <laughs> but they're but in the same time, I don't treat them like they're you know. I, I think in jujitsu especially, you know, when we're teaching these fundamental movements and fucking shrimping across yeah. the mat and everything. They're not stroke victims we're working with. You know, they're they're you know able-bodied athletes. They can pick that stuff up, stuff stuff up rather quickly. So while I don't expect anything too much from them, I also know that our, as human bodies, we're incredibly capable of wonderful things and learning at a rapid pace. So yeah, now let's try and make this as practical as possible. There might be someone training at their martial arts gym. Maybe they're generally just doing a lot of drills, pad work, heavy bag, drilling arm bars and shrimping and whatnot but they don't get as much time maybe being in front of someone, technical sparring, whatever it is. What are some what are some situational games that they can do at home maybe with a partner to work on? So that, I, I know there's probably a lot depending on what you want to work on and things, but maybe just some general games that you like to go to normally for striking and grappling and things like that. Okay, so again, I'm not trying to evade the question, Here's the thing with with, with give, and I, I will give an ex- I'm going to give an example of games. I just want to qualify this this too. So I think we're in an industry now, and that that it's a very much a my techniques better than your technique, or I can explain this technique better than you you can explain your technique. The whole the whole concept of kind of non-linearity and ecological approaches, we don't really know. Uh, you know, if if we do such and such, this will, you know. That yeah. such and such will be the result of this. There is there's there's an inherent chaos and as I said, non-linear the whole the whole thing. So what we're doing is we're trying to find 
we try and find features or they call them, you know, inv invariants. We're trying to find key features of that either strategy or the tactic, and we'll start playing games to promote that. Mm -hmm. Um, let me, so from, from a, from a grappling perspective, um, let's take, let, 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 let's take, a, oh, let's take a standing entanglement, right? So to be dominant in a standing clinching entanglement, generally speaking, you need to win the grip fighting yep. for the inside space. You need to control the center mass mm -hmm. and you're constantly trying to off balance your partner. And if we can play games like that, just starting out, which might be, you know, we, we do that a lot in our, our beginner's class. We might, because it's, we, we don't want to introduce takedowns too early because they're, they're not quite comfortable. They're not quite confident. They're not quite sure where to put their body in space. So we'll start scaling up from there. But it might be a simple over-under mm -hmm. and they're going to jockey for position. So instead of that classic, you know, pummeling, pummeling warm-up you see people doing, yeah. it, it's, not a, it's not a big jump from that. But they're going to start with the over-under and they're going to fight to get the body lock. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you start seeing them redistributing their weight. You see them, you know, um, fighting the grips, uh, fighting natural levers and stuff. This, this all comes out organically every single time I do it. And we'll build on games like that. And then over time, you're going to scale up where you might, you know, ultimately get to just full on wrestling or whatever or full on clinching. But you just pick the, the, key, the key concepts, the key invariants there don't really change. So... It's just the space we, we push the learners into. I don't know if that quite answered your question. The game, so again, just knowing a game wouldn't, for, for me, it's just like knowing a technique. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't mean that much in and of itself. Uh, for striking, uh, what I like to do is a lot of lefty versus righty because it encourages my students and my team to explore both, both stances. But I think it's also good for distance management winning that front hand battle. I'm a big advocate of long long guards in MMA and controlling that space in front of you. Mm -hmm. So games like that, we'll just play a little game of tag, you know, or um, you might have only your lead hand and your rear leg. And depending again on where the students are at, we'll, we'll, we'll add things and we'll subtract things. Wow, awesome. It's really, it's really not that more, more difficult than that. And, and what happens in the time of the games, once you get a game that you th think, you know, it is... It's producing good results. You you vary that game, or if one you think's been a colossal disaster, you just <laughs> fucking scrap that and go on to someone else. But and, and by varying games, for example, in that striking context, it might be only jabbing or, or only right hand, or you can only do certain movements, or changing the tempo. All these things would mm -hmm. fill in that variation. Yeah, or you can you know you can do things to elicit uh, footwork and lateral movement. Um, you know you can do things to. Uh, illicit combinations by you know saying i want you to move up and down the body if you can mm -hmm. you know you split the body into the, the top middle bottom see if you can move up and down the layers that that tends to you know uh, promote and facilitate combinations appearing and, and and redirection and feints and fakes and all that so yeah it, it, personally for me that's that's my endeavor now i go in and i'll, I'll have some ideas of of games and then if the games seem to be you know really really good and they're well received and i think they're working mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the last thing I'll say about games is um, I, I think each coach has to, it is good. I have people reaching out to me all the time asking me what the game is to play. And, and to be honest, I, I don't know. I just have some ideas and you'll pick it up over time. Mm. Um, the important thing is not to expect too much and, and just, you know, see if you, if you keep someone in a space long enough and you start to see it appear when it comes into sparring or performance, that, that's some kind of validation or feedback that, that what you're actually doing is working in transfer. Nice. With inspiring itself, how often are you, uh, I guess, varying maybe hard sparring with some of these different constraints you're using? Well, I have a young team at the moment, and I'm quite the Pollyanna when it comes to head trauma. Mm. I know you spoke with uh, Gary Smiley yeah. Turner, so um, he he bums me out every time I listen to him. <laughs> I um, <laughs> right. So, but again. You know, it seems like I get in on this conversation all the time when I'm, when I'm on these discussions, but most of these kids are going to be hobbyists. Uh, even the ones who do have lofty aspirations probably won't make it to the big, big, big leagues. Mm -hmm. We have to be honest. So I don't think there's a reasonable amount of head trauma you can take. But if they're going to fight um, and they'll bring it into it, it's important to, you know, we have to be somewhat authentic and somewhat real. Yeah. But... To answer your question, I actually we actually don't do any hard sparring. Now, when I mean hard sparring, we're not we're not going hard to the head. What I'd rather do is put them into amateur matches, amateur competition, and get the feel for that. 
it's tough, you know, going going hard because you have to switch it on and switch it mm-hmm. off, and then teammates going against teammates and stuff, and then maybe they can't train. And if you're telling me a gym, which again, it's it's, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not making a really, I'm not really making a judgment on that. But if you say you're sparring hard once a week, for me, that's probably a mild to um, a, a mild concussion at least once yeah. a week. Yeah, which is worrying. Because <laughs> a lot of people now, what Gary would say, if Gary was to look at our practice, he'd probably say even the, even the light stuff we do, because we do a lot of sparring, mm-hmm. right? So even the light head contact is going to have a cumulative effect, yeah. and, and I, th- I think he's probably right. I I, I don't know how to balance yeah. that, other than other than not do it at all. I know Gary, I think I think he does kickboxing now and stuff, and he doesn't do any head contact. Well, that's fair enough, but it it, it flies kind of in the face of what we're trying to do is be be real and authentic and representative so it's a balance and some some guys i'll you know i'll let off a leash a little more and some i'll protect a little more but um for us at our gym it's just been creating that culture of they all respect the they respect the headshots they respect each other's training partners and i can put uh one of my heavyweight guys with one of my newer girls and there's a lot of control and trust there with each other yeah that's really good i guess yeah hit contact is unavoidable at some point if you're going to to fight right like it's right. it's just part, part of the game unfortunately but <clears throat> yeah I, I like the idea even with the with the sparring it, it's light head contact i guess around that that 50 percent head contact is nice so if someone is you see you mentioned obviously for someone who wants to fight instead of doing hard sparring they might do an amateur some kind of amateur belt how how are you preparing them leading into that then is it still doing a lot of light sparring and then they have to make that jump in intensity for that fight just to get a feel for it or is there some way that you're ramping up that intensity of those of those sparring sessions i don't know i have such a good answer for that i mean as i said when we can get people we can trust and whatnot i put my team through pancreation first so that's non-head contact mma mm. so it's full full forces as hard as they can hit it's just not to the oh, head good. i think that can help I, I still don't think it's it's i still don't think it's 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 perfect it's a perfect solution um now a lot of my team are just going in you know we've only been open three years so we've been developing them slow and they're starting to come into the mma um i don't know if i have a, a great answer for that one <laughs> no it's all good now it's not to say that we don't have harder sparring coming up to a fight but i haven't yet been able to justify putting my guys in a cage and going whole hog mm. just yet now if we continue down this line and it appears that we're we're not able to we're not able to get in the cage and there's a big mismatch between the way we're sparring and the way the fight is, I think that's maybe something I'll have to revisit. So at the moment, I'm saying, okay, I'm just going to play it cautiously, uh, put them in and see how it goes. I know for myself, I only had a few, uh, like eight amateur fights in total between the, the three disciplines and it took me five or six fights to really start settling down and I see that. Uh, one thing I, I do want to, when, when anyone talks about fighting or this is one of my big frustrations, James, is especially sh- striking coaches, right? Most coaches mean well, but sometimes, do you actually do you actually watch fighting? Do you actually watch mm-hmm. fighting? Because even at the highest level, it's it's nothing that fancy. Mm-hmm. I watch a lot of one at the moment. I love, I love the kickboxing and the tie on one. It's singles, uh, it's it single shots, it, like strikes, single set strikes, doubles and triples for the most part. And then when they sense that blood, then, then they'll let it go. But a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing on pads and the routines and the fluffy the step overs <laughs> and and the lateral movement and that, I think there's a huge disconnect there. I just don't see that really in fighting. You can now occasionally you occasionally you'll see it, but and then talking about the amateur levels, well, it's just like bum fight after bum fight <laughs> to be honest, right? And it, 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 it is so. Whether so, so again, like w- w- if it's not showing up, if it's if the stuff you're drilling is not showing up in the fights, and even at the highest level of fights, it's not really showing up because it's more, it, it's pretty simple. Then what's the answer? Are we not drilling enough? Or is perhaps the answer that, that there's really not a great deal of transfer? Mm. Do you feel there's some value in learning maybe some of those fancier combinations or even fancier techniques just to have them in the toolbox? Or is it more just, hey, just the situation, you just, you figure out how to land, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need to do all the other stuff. So this is disagreement between the ecological people, right? They're really kind of the, the hard-nosed ecological advocates would say, no, no, you, you, know, you never strip the context away. I tend to be a little bit more on the middle. 
there's a lot of these techniques, uh, you know, spinning wheel kicks, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff, axe kicks, um, that we we just can't work on our on our partners. Yeah. The same thing with um, the way we spar, right? We're we're not really sitting down on our punches trying to knock each other out. So where will that power develop? Yeah. That then sneaks in the opportunity. Yeah, we can we can use bags and bad. So you asked about putting tools in your toolbox. I think the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better. But just be nice that you know how to use the tools and when to use them. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned about the, okay, for power development and stuff, okay, you might have the pads and heavy bag. It's almost like the situational stuff that you're doing, the games, all those drills, those are there for technical development. You're mm. learning the game, developing agility, reaction, all that kind of stuff. And then the, the actual pads and heavy bag is almost like conditioning, developing power, or, or just to kind of transfer or give you that taste of being able to, as you mentioned, sit on those punches or actually throw things at full power. No, I agree, and I think it is a conditioning tool. I think what happens when we say, okay, well, you have the space to be able to practice your techniques and then start putting them into context. Well, again, that's that's the whole ecological approach uh, kind of dismisses that. Yeah, my, my so I, I'm not a not just because I'm sick of getting inflamed elbows and whatnot, and I don't want that. I, I don't hold pads really for my team, but they'll they'll jump off to the side and do pad work and play around and use it as conditioning tools. So. Mm. I just keep telling you, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a supplement, yeah. uh, not a substitute. Yeah, and it's often used, as you mentioned, as, as almost like the main, the main part of sessions, right? That would be like a typical session, maybe, uh, I guess a common way. Do you maybe dive into how your session is structured versus maybe a traditional session in that aspect? So I think what about I think I could be a bit unfair to a traditional system because I, I think it's a kind of a mishmash, right? And when you, again, I didn't want to get wordy today, but when you see things through an ecological lens that we're always, uh, we're always engaged dynamically with our environment and what we're trying to achieve, I don't think, I think even the traditional, the so-called traditional approach is still ecological. Hmm. What I think they're doing is they're spending a lot of time uh, robbing context or, or trying to develop in, in, in the context that's not, not real or not going to transfer very well. Um, and most gym, most traditional gyms, they'll, they'll do their, their technical work, they'll have their situational work, and they'll do their do their sparring, right? And so, to say that there's a there's a, a true contrast between the the, the two approaches, I, I think, is a little false. I think there's a there's a strong overlap between them. Mm. What we're trying to do is just say, well, parse out what's probably likely effective and what works the most, and then just try and s cram as much as that as we can into the, the learning hour. Yeah, yeah. Um, our classes are quite short. So I, I, again, and then there's so many other variables, isn't there, James? How often you're training, how motivated you are, what kind of, how so-called coachable you are. Are you, are you actually trying to come in and work on your weaknesses and stuff? So there's a whole list of other things that have to come together. Um, but so when I hear the traditional model, it's not so much that it's, it's, it's completely at odds with an ecological model. I think there's great parts of the traditional model and it clearly works i mean mm -hmm. you get tremendous fighters coming out of that system um why we, we used to start you know kind of poking fun maybe the the jiu-jitsu purists that'll, that'll spend 15 minutes shrimping, up, <laughs> shrimping yeah. up and down i mean for me that that's that's absurd yeah it's just absurd you know because it, it makes no sense to me what does it do it bores the fuck out of everyone yeah. no one wants to do that nope. i mean if someone says they like drilling or they like shrimping yeah okay i mean <laughs> <laughs> If you do it, fair enough, right? And maybe there's a ritualistic aspect to it. That's you know comes in and switches on. But uh, why why waste why waste everyone's time? Yeah. And all coaches will rationalise. Well, it's a fundamental movement. You need this. You need the shrimping movement. You'll never be able to get a side a side pin or whatever. I, I don't buy all that. I think it's horseshit for the most part. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, that's 15 minutes wasted of an hour class doing that. And you can shrimp. Well, if it's 50 minutes, but it's 25. percent Yeah, exactly. And you can and you can shrimp perfectly. In those drills but you have someone on you in side control and then they're moving around and you shrimp and try to get on your side but they've got their hands in different places they've got their body weight in different places and you're trying to get that shrimp going it doesn't doesn't always work and that's something I, I i am seeing less of that you know my whether it was just algorithms or i was sensitive to it every time i opened any kind of instagram you would see all that nonsense but I, i'm seeing less and less of it so I think intuitively uh, a lot of the you know more progressive and gyms that are doing well mm -hmm. are, are moving towards a bit more gameliness and liveliness. But again, right back to the start, we we're saying it's situational. It's just situational sparring. Well, 
No, but kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice. All right, I think we'll finish this one. We had a few technical difficulties through this. I'm edit it all together and, and make sure hopefully it sounds all right. But if people want to find you, Scott, where, where can they do that? Uh, so, uh, and by the way, um, I came across your podcast uh, a month or so ago when I because I'm always taking my head out my ass and uh, looking what if Gary's Gary Turner's been on any podcasts um, now occasionally. So that's how I came across oh, wow. him. That's how I came across John McKay. So good stuff. I see you pumping out that content. Um, I run my own um, training podcast, the Primal MMA training podcast, which again I like to speak other coaches like yourself, academics and whatnot. But you can hit up the gym on Primal MKE uh, on Instagram. Uh, give us a follow if, if you want or reach out. Tell me I'm full of shit or ask me questions, whatever. <laughs> oh, perfect. I'll... I like I like I like talking with coaches. I'm I'm definitely trying again. I, I think part of the earlier when I was trying to communicate this stuff, I'd I try and use fluffier words than than were necessary to get yeah. my point across. And that's been a epic fucking disaster. <laughs> so I'm just gonna try and speak like a coach speaks. And as I say, um, if, if I I feel I've got a decent grasp of what I'm trying to do, so I I can answer questions. Um, but yeah, I, I'm always I'm always up for pushback. Yeah, oh, perfect. I'll, I'll link all those up in the description too when this goes up. But but thanks for coming on, Scott. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries, and uh, appreciate you, and uh, keep up the good fight, bud. Cheers.